The American Lung Association has been saving lives by preventing lung disease and promoting lung health in our local communities for more than 100 years. And today, achieving health equity is at the core of everything we do. We believe everyone should have the same chance at healthy lungs and clean air, but we all know that too often those families with the most to lose get the least access to quality health care, the finest hospitals, and even clean air. This is one reason we've launched Community Connections free, interactive conversation with San Diego healthcare professionals and medical experts on the health topics most affecting our communities. My fellow board member, Dr. Tim Morris of UCSD, likes to call them dinners with doctors. For more information about weekly topics and more, please visit lung.org forward slash events. I hope to see you there. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Tony Nguyen Jr. for that. Uh, for that message. Uh, my name is Dr. Philippe Montgrain and I'm uh, covering for Dr. Tim Morris here tonight. Uh, I am a local pulmonologist um, at uh, UCSD in the VA San Diego and a member of the American Lung Association Mission Committee, um, which Dr. Morris chairs. The mission committee is uh, composed of many local experts in all areas of health and environmental uh, health and policy. And our job is to advise and guide the American Lung, Associ Lung Association on how best they can um, serve the community and fulfill their mission. One of the things the mission committee does are these uh, dinner with the doc or community connections. And I would like to uh, thank the Burr Heart and Lung Clinic uh, at Sharp Grossmont Hospital as well as the San Diego Foundation for making these uh, community connections possible. Uh, we've had a lot of great topics so far, um, covering everything from COVID-19 to lung cancer screening to wildfires and air quality. I encourage you all to go to the American Lung Association YouTube video where you can watch those if you wanna catch up, if you weren't able to uh, watch them live. Uh, tonight, we have a great uh, presentation on the biology of COVID-19 infection. We're going to hear from Dr. Evan Snyder and Dr. Sandra Liebel at the Sanford Burnham Prebus uh, Discovery Institute. Next week, on November 10th, we're going to hear about the San Diego County response to COVID-19. And then the week after, on the 17th, we're going to hear about a lung-healthy diet and mindfulness. So please be sure to join us for those two uh, following the weeks. Uh, before I turn it over to today's speakers, I just want to re remind everyone that uh, at the end of the presentation, we will have a local, a panel of local experts and, and mission committee members join us for a Q&A session. Uh, so at this point, it's my pleasure to turn it over to, I'm not sure who's going first, Dr. Evan Snyder <laughs> or, uh, or Sandra Liebel. Well, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll introduce us and then I'll introduce Sandra and Sandra will do a, a brief slide presentation, then we'll open it to any questions at all that people want to uh, want to pose to us. Perfect. This is a real honor for us to be able to to participate in this I think. Uh, some of you may know from uh, from from other presentations that. Uh, Sandra and I are actually neonatologists, so we work with baby lungs. However, we're also scientific colleagues and share a lab, and in that regard, we look at uh, mini lungs, even smaller than newborn lungs, really mini lungs in a dish, and these are called lung organoids that Sandra will describe, but basically, we start with stem cells and then layer by layer, cell type by cell type, make many lungs in a dish. And we've been very fortunate in being able to use these to a model uh, COVID-19. In other words, as Sandra will describe, infect them with SARS-CoV-2, but then also to try to understand uh, the virus's life cycle and what drugs may block that. And, and even, again, as, as Sandra will talk about, why there may be differences in response to either the virus or to the drugs 
based on all kinds of things, gender, uh, racial background, things of that sort. And then some of the insights that actually uh, we as neonatologists may be able to contribute to this disease, even though it, it, it affects adults and, and older people. Even though we're neonatologists, uh, some of our best friends are adults. So we, we, we do care about them. Um, with that kind of introduction, um, I, I think I'll turn it over to, uh, to Sandra, who's uh, an assistant, soon to be associate professor at UCSD in the Department of Pediatrics. And uh, I'm also in the Department of Pediatrics and we share a lab here at the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine. Thank you, Evan. Thank you for the introduction. I will share my screen to start the presentation. And I'll put it in. Can everyone see the slide? Uh, not yet. Okay, let me actually share in a different way then. I'll just do the whole screen. Yeah. Two, perfect. Okay, there we go. I think you can everyone see it now. Not now, it's good. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so thank you for your patience. I am here to present, as Evan um, told everyone, uh, a little summary of our pluripotent stem cell derived lung organoid model system, specifically to a model human lung disease. Um, there's a lot of model systems out there, usually animal-based, and there's some primary lung systems as well. So here I'm introducing a different way to uh, model human lung disease in a dish. And um, specifically, the majority of this presentation will be how um, we've I've been studying SARS-CoV-2 and uh, the disease that it causes, COVID-19. But the last slide is kind of like our um, entrance into the lung cancer world as well. So. Let's start off with uh, deriving uh, these lung organoids and how it's done. Uh, usually we take somatic cells, which are either white blood cells or uh, fibroblast skin cells, and we add uh, various what are called the aminapa factors um, and add them into these somatic stem cells um, in order to then plural, um, generate pluripotent stem cells. And uh, that's actually kind of going backwards in the developmental process. Just like Evan said, um, we're neonatologists, we're interested in the development of organ systems, uh, but kind of creating these pluripotent stem cells from mature, uh, fully differentiated cells is kind of like a step backwards. And what's very unique about utilizing a system like this instead of just obtaining primary lung tissue, which in itself is a very difficult feat because you have to wait for an actual patient to be uh, in the OR um, or getting a surgical biopsy, is that uh, we can actually obtain these in a very simplified manner, as I've already said, blood cells or skin cells, easy biopsies or an easy blood draw. And we can actually um, use different patients, including patients from different ethnicities, patients from different sexes. Uh, trans differentiation can be used in either old or young patients to maintain their epigenetic uh, markers in order to maintain that cell in its either old or young state. And then um, previously, I've actually looked at uh, various genetic um, malformations in uh, surfactant. And so we're able to uh, look at genetic predispositions or genetic backgrounds um, in these actual lung model systems and also try and mimic some comorbidities by adding um, different uh, small molecules or factors into uh, these uh, cell cultures in order to then uh, kind of um, in vitro, try to mimic what is actually occurring in vivo, whether it's increasing exposure to inflammation or whether it's senescing the cells uh, by adding doxorubicin. So there's a lot of things that we can um, add to these simplified lung culture systems um, in order to mimic in vivo lung disease. So the cocktail molecules that push the adult cells back in developmental time, as I've mentioned, and um, they are uh, in parallel to embryonic stem cells, except that embryonic stem cells do come specifically from the embryo. And here's a little picture of the embryo. There's an inner cell mass of the blastocyst. And these cells are pluripotent in the sense that they can make all three germ layers of the fetus, um, which then go on to make every single organ system in uh, the newborn and human. 
<clears throat> then we look back to see the differentiation of uh, pluripotent stem cells or embryonic stem cells and how they differentiate through endoderm, which is the layer that we're interested in because that's what is uh, lung is derived from. Um, and we actually add specific cocktails at specific timings in order to inhibit or activate uh, different signaling mechanisms um, and follow first definitive endodermal uh, anterior foregut, et cetera, into lung progenitors that express NKX2-1 to finally create mature three-dimensional lung organoids. And these we call patient-specific mini lungs in a dish. And so, as I've said before, we can add various compounds and chemicals in order to uh, kind of replicate what happens um, environmentally. So these are phase contrast images of the uh, three-dimensional mini lungs in a dish. And obviously it takes a village. So here are multiple members of our lab that um, are indispensable to growing, maintaining, as well as analyzing um, these uh, lung organoids. And here are a couple of videos uh, just to kind of show you uh, what we're able uh, to utilize or what we're able to make. So the top kind of green image is week two of 3D uh, lung differentiation. And at this point, we actually add dexamethasone. And that's where you see the largest uh, phenotypic changes in these lung organoids. You can actually see that they're growing, they're budding, they're um, alveolarizing. And um, that, that's all within the first 24 hours of the addition of dexamethasone and using that uh, chemical actually really pushes the lung organoids into a more mature state, as well as, you know, um, helps with alveolarization. As uh, we see as neonatologists, again, when a mom comes in in preterm labor, she receives betamethasone in order to induce fetal lung maturation in her fetus. Um, and so we're kind of replicating the same thing in a dish. And then if you look at the bottom left on my side image of the face contrast image of these three-dimensional lung organoids, and you can see them kind of um, having some spastic-like movements. And that's because we're not only making epithelial cells, but we're also making stromal cells. This differentiation allows epithelial and mesenchymal cells to be developing in parallel together. And we believe it's the smooth muscle actin that's able to contract and allow these kind of breathing-like motions of these lung organoids. And then finally, uh, we call these whole lung organoids or multicellular lung organoids because they're not only a specific type of, let's say, alveolar type two um, alveolar sphere, which a lot of labs are just really focusing on. They just wanna make type two cells. But from our standpoint, we are really interested in the entire lung because that will actually give us a lot more information um, because lung cells do not develop in isolation. A type two cell, um, is dependent on multiple factors to develop um, as well as function. And therefore we would um, prefer to make a multicellular lung organoid that expresses most of the cells of the lung. And so you can see here that when we take the organoids and actually put them down in an air liquid interface cell culture system, we actually start seeing cilia. And that's what you're seeing here circled by those white circles is uh, the actual cilia feeding. Um, so to make this even more complex, <laughs> so we're adding layers and layers, just like Evan said, in order to uh, really mimic not only lung epithelial and stromal cells, but the lung tissue. And what lung tissue also needs is a vascular supply as well as an immune cell population. So what we're showing here is that we're actually able to utilize uh, pluripotent stem cells, and again, from the same genetic background as the ones that were that we derived the lung organoids from, in order to make vascularized cells. And then we can co-culture them together in order to have lung organoids with at least an endothelial cell population that um, can impact signaling. And then finally, we can also invest these mini lung organoids or even vascularized organoids with inflammatory cells. And what we've been doing in the lab is really trying to achieve from, you know, again, pluripotent stem cells um, through hematopoietic differentiation in order to make um, alveolar macrophages. So specifically uh, macrophages that are found in lung tissue. And <clears throat> as everyone here knows, are very important in <clears throat> the homeostasis of the lung, not only in development, but also in disease. So that's really our goal is to be able to mimic lung tissue in a dish. So, 
as everyone here knows, this is the makeup of the lung. And with our lung organoid cultures, we can obviously not truly replicate uh, this three-dimensional orientation with the trachea, the bronchi, and the parenchyma. But we do our best. And what we're able to do is at least form a three-dimensional system. Um, and as I've mentioned before, we take pluripotent stem cells and drive them through the um, endoderm. Um, following all of the different um, um, uh, signals that occur in uh, this germ layer until we reach the lung progenitor cell, which is um, the first cell to become a lung and it's expressing NKX2-1, which is an important transcription factor, not only in lung development, but also in the homeostasis of uh, surfactant and alveolar type two cells. Um, and then we continue with our three-dimensional co-culture system uh, for about three weeks after achieving a lung progenitor cell. And these are just phase contrast images of week by week changes that the lung organoids derive. And here we show three-dimensional um, activation of the lung progenitor cells. Then we see a lot of branching morphogenesis. And again, we're using the same signals as are known in different animal models that you know, induced uh, branching morphogenesis. And finally, you could see here day 29 to day 30, that's that 24 hours where we add the dexamethasone. And as you saw in that previous uh, video, they go from these kind of dense branching organoids into now they're starting to develop more. Now they're starting to mature, form these more grape-like um, uh, little sections. And then finally, after a week of exposure to dexamethasone, they're finally uh, these various types of lung organoids. So, um, these contain, like I've said before, cells that are found up in the trachea and bronchi, as well as closer to the alveoli, and then um, parenchymal or alveolar type 1 and type 2 cells as well. So in a dish, we have a very heterogeneous population of these lung organoids. And here's just a schematic of showing what kind of cells that we're able to generate, um, whether they're type 2 cells expressing SPC, goblet cells, basal cells, club cells, and I've already shown you the video of uh, the ciliated cells. And then we've all obviously done um, lots of protein analysis as well and shown the presence of mesenchymal markers, one of them just being SMA, um, and, but we've also shown many others. And so using this model system, we have then gone on to um, understand the biology of SARS-CoV-2 by infecting them. And here we're gonna share our results. So at first, um, when we were just testing the system, I was actually getting BSL-3 certified. So we needed a, a virus that mimicked SARS-CoV-2 without actually having to be uh, handled in a BSL-3 facility. And so the, we were able to obtain a pseudovirus in collaboration with um, uh, Dr. Chanda's lab. And what they did is they took a VSV virus and um, uh, linked it with a spike protein um, labeled with a reporter uh, for GFP. And that's what you're seeing here. And so then what we did is we took these organoids and we kept them as three-dimensional organoids, just put them in a low, ultra low attachment plate as well as left some in matrix gel just to see if it could penetrate through matrix gel. And we infected them and saw that um, in a 3D model system, the virus is still able to penetrate and infect them in three dimension. But what was even easier is when we dissociated the three-dimensional organoids and plated them as a monolayer in order to increase that exposure in the apical layer. And here we saw, again, um, lots of GFP being expressed in um, after infection with the pseudovirus. So then what we wanted to see is what kind of cells was a pseudovirus infecting. And again, this is a virus that has the spike protein, but once it enters the cells, it is replication deficient. So it is unable to replicate. All it is able to do is enter the cell through the spike protein and then glow um, or express the GFP. But it does not replicate and therefore it cannot use other methods to enter the lung cells like um, the authentic SARS-CoV-2 virus can. So we took our infected lung culture system and performed um, flow cytometry and sorting for life cells only, and then sorted them for GFP positive and GFP negative. And we found that in our lung culture systems, this is a single cell uh, data UMAP, we found that the largest clusters were epithelial cells. There was some KI50, KI67 cells as well, which we called cyclone cells. We had a nice small little population of the stromal or fibroblast cells. Um, these immune cells, we are not sure whether they're actually 
immune base hematopoietic cells or whether they're just a cluster of cells that express immune markers, but they were very, very high in expressing a lot of the chemokines, cytokines, um, and interferons. And what's interesting is this basal cell population, um, this actually was found to appear in the infected GFP positive. So in the acute, and again, this was only a 24 hour infection. And that's another reason why this is a little bit more helpful than looking at primary lung tissue. Um, Cause if you've been reading the literature there have been multiple, multiple, you know, high tier published articles about taking um, autopsy tissue after COVID-19, um, obviously fatal pneumonia and assessing, you know, the state of these lung cells. But um, from the standpoint of a biologist, um, that's like three or four weeks out from initial infection. That's probably during the, you know, the highest peak of the inflammatory response of the body. And those results are probably skewed a little bit by the fact that all these patients underwent mechanical ventilation. So you're not really sure whether, you know, the responses from the lung cells of these primary um, single cell data sets, which again are fantastic and, you know, any information is good information, uh, but this is a much cleaner system. So even though it, you know, it's not, 100% the human lung. Um, it gets us more closer to the actual biology of the virus infecting human cells. And so what's interesting is in that first 24 hours, basal cells really do get highly infected um, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. While if you look at that three-week tissue, there was very few basal cells that were infected. So something is happening very early on to the stem cells of the lung. And here we're just pointing out what I've already just told you. And so then, great, we can do pseudovirus infections, but um, what is occurring in the lung organoids after being infected with the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus. So after I um, was BSL-3 trained, I went to the BSL-3 lab at UCSD and started infecting these lung organoids with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, initially, it was the Washington strain because this was back early in April, May of uh, 2020. Um, but since, you know, we've uh, obtained all the other strains and working with Delta actually currently. So um, all this data is with the Washington strain. And we've already done a couple of these. Um, and so we can't obviously sort because there's no sorter in a BSL-3 facility. So I use a dead cell removal kit um, instead in order to hopefully only isolate live cells. So this is from a first set of um, infections that we did in the lung organoids. And I usually infect them as three-dimensional organoids because again, that's more representative than a two-dimensional uh, system, even though we have done that as well. But the single cell all came from infecting the three-dimensional multicellular lung organoids. So what you can see here and that we found really intriguing is that just looking at the SARS-CoV-2 genome, you could see that it's actually present in every cluster versus these are the two batch controls of no infection. And so then we repeated these again and this time, um, what we actually wanted to identify is the separate genes of SARS-CoV-2, not necessarily just, you know, just in general SARS-CoV-2. So you can see here that um, the different genes themselves of the virus are expressed in different quantities um, from a transcriptional standpoint in the different clusters. So just to orientate everyone, these are violin plots of our single cell data. Um, the genes of the virus are all labeled up here. Uh, the, if you look at the bottom three, those are the ones with the highest representation in the clusters. And here's nucleocapsid, S is for spike, and then ORF10. And you could see that the highest cluster is cluster 11 for all the different um, genes, even up here, um, the ones that are less well represented, but also kind of the same thing that we saw in our previous data set that there are representations of genetic data of the virus in each cluster, more so nucleocapsid than any other uh, gene, which we found actually very fascinating. So in order to, this is gene data, we wanted to verify everything from a protein standpoint. And so we performed flow cytometry of the three-dimensional lung organoids and um, utilized the antibodies against nucleocapsid, which is here on the y-axis, and spike, which is here on the x-axis. And you can see here using our lung organoid model system, we're getting a very large shift into double positivity. And then this is our monolayer system where we actually dissociate the 3D, plate them down in a monolayer system. And that way we can actually do a lot of high throughput um, studies. And we've done that with multiple 96 well plates um, and uh, testing various compounds, which I'll show. 
Um, but the monolayer mod uh, system is also very helpful in um, not only just confirming um, the efficacy of spread of the virus, but actually performing focused um, uh, colony units and seeing how within a specific um, space of the lung organoids, the cell is actually spreading. And uh, what we found, but um, I'm, we're just like generating the data now, is that the virus does not necessarily need ACE2 in order to spread from cell to cell. So why, okay, now that we found that we can infect the organoids and we've also generated a lot of their um, inflammatory um, signaling pathways that occur, both you know, among the clusters as well as inter-cluster. Um, now what we wanna do is that next step and what we have done is to determine whether there's some mechanisms of viral entry that we could possibly block with different compounds that have already been FDA approved or already on the market or are used for another type of disease such as cancer and whether we could just repurpose these different compounds in order to utilize in, again, early infection of SARS-CoV-2 as you probably heard, the latest news is, is that there is a medication now that's available for early um, onset uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, just like Tamiflu for the flu virus. So that is definitely something that is of interest. And um, if we can obviously get something a lot cheaper than the, what's on the market, um, then it could be more wide, widely um, shared, more widely utilized um, in a more equitable fashion. So um, we have been able to utilize our organoids um, and show effective inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 infection with these repurposed or new drugs. Um, currently, we're still undergoing all the various uh, drug compounds and um, we're not published yet, which is why we're just calling them compound one, compound two for now. Um, but you could see that compared to uninfected uh, virus alone, there are multiple compounds that do decrease the percent infectivity of the lung organoids. And then another thing that I had already mentioned is if we take these lung organoids from different sexes and backgrounds, can we actually determine if there's a patient specific response to these medications in order to combat uh, infectivity? And so uh, we've actually infected a lot of different lung organoids from a lot of different backgrounds. These are only two representations and we're still repeating these experiments. Um, um, but what you can see is that infectivity is a little higher. And again, I know there's no error bars, which is why we're just gonna continue to repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, but just from our preliminary data, we're seeing that there is slightly increased uh, viral infectivity in the um, IPSC derived lung organoids that came from a Hispanic male, and that um, uh, applying a pilamod, which is one of the drugs that we're testing, has a more of an effect um, in a Caucasian female versus of the Hispanic male um, IPSC derived lung organoids. Um, and so this may not only help us determine uh, from a patient specific manner, um, why maybe some um, uh, genetic backgrounds or sexes or um, ethnic backgrounds may be more susceptible to infection, or we may determine that it actually, that the genome has nothing to do with it. It's more of the epigenome and it's more of the social economic status and the environmental impacts that actually increase the inf infectivity. And that's why it's very important to you know, have that caveat in mind when performing all of these infections. But if there is a way to determine that maybe it's more of uh, a single mono um, therapeutic option may not actually be, in fact, be um, the most uh, efficacious for reducing infectivity, but we may actually start to have to build cocktails of having some viral entry um, inhibitors and put them together with some anti-inflammatory um, inhibitors such as the IL-6 that is currently used clinically, dexamethasone, everything that's currently used clinically, but you know, clinical trials don't have them as you know, extremely impactful. But if we start building cocktails, testing them first in our lung organoid system, and then moving them into clinical trials, bypassing the, the need for animal models. And also, as everyone knows, animal models um, don't always uh, trans, those findings don't always translate into uh, human clinical trials. Um, this, is, this would be great to uh, continue to generate. So that's our COVID-19, uh, and as previously promised, uh, what we're actually looking at in parallel 
to um, how um, respiratory viruses affect the human lung. Uh, we're also looking at these next generation models of cancer. And so what we're actually able to do is induce selective oncogenic changes within these iPSC cells or within the organoids themselves and start to actually model um, you know, known genetic deficiencies that result in the future in lung cancer. And then one of these ways is to, again, induce the oncogenic mutation and then start to differentiate the lungs into lung organoids and find that timing when the oncogene turns on and whether there's something that we can detect at an earlier standpoint in our lung culture system when the oncogene turns on, whether there's other biomarkers that we can then apply to uh, you know, actual uh, human uh, lung cancer disease. Um, another way to model uh, cancer in the dish is to reprogram. So you take a lung tumor or a lung cancer line, reprogram those back into iPSCs, just like we do in order to reprogram them anyways from you know, blood or uh, fibroblasts, and then differentiate them back into lung organoids in order to allow that cancer to reemerge, to reemerge and then study that um, reemerging pattern and um, all the transcription um, uh, factors that uh, occur during that time. And again, assess to see if we can determine any biomarkers that allow us to have a more earlier detection of uh, lung cancer than we currently do now. And this is just a paper uh, that was published by the group just to show that this is feasible and uh, definitely something new on the horizon. So that's all I've got to share and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Lebo. That was really interesting. I think at this point we'll bring in um, our other panelists. Um, so if I can ask our moderator to let in whoever is out there, uh, maybe I'll get started with the question. Um, really neat tool you have there. And I imagine hours of, of, of work to develop such a great model and uh, and I'm sure, um, you know, beyond what you've discussed with COVID and lung cancer, I think probably numerous different uh, potential applications of this model. And I imagine it's fairly high throughput. Once you get it established, you can test lots of these drugs for repurposing. Can you give us a sense of that? Like how, how, how much can you test in, in, in one given model? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we've able to do with collaborators um, is provide them with, um, so far we've only gone up to two full 96 well plates, but we can obviously expand that. Um, all it is is a matter of how many people are available to you know, grow, proliferate, and then passage the uh, lung organoids. But we are able to provide them with um, two full 96 well plates of lung organoids um, in a monolayer system. So then they bring that into the BSL-3, they add their compounds, and they can add their compounds at different concentrations to also test for toxicity by looking at cell death as well as infectivity. Um, and so we've actually published with a group that um, their paper was entitled Rethinking Remdesivir, and they actually found an orally available lipid-based molecule that mimics um, the mode of action of remdesivir. And they actually used our um, human lung organoid system mm -hmm. to uh, look at that. And then also what we're currently doing right now is uh, using siRNAs or uh, inhibitory RNAs. Again, in a very high throughput, I think we probably ran four 96 well plates yesterday um, and just inhibited different genes that you know, we believe that the virus uses in order to gain entry and replicate, um, as well as <clears throat> delete some of the genes from the actual lung epithelial cell itself uh, that may be important in um, expressing different inflammatory markers that are either helpful or harmful, depending on your age um, and depending on the hyperactivity of your immune system. And so not only, you know, the compounds can be tested in a high throughput manner, but also uh, knocking down genes and actually looking at biological mechanisms can be done in a high throughput manner with the system. Mm -hmm. I see Dr. Welsh joining us. Thank you, Dr. Welsh, for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions, please, I'll I'll let you ask them. I did have one other question. Um, you, you mentioned it in passing that um, so, so 
for those listening, one of the ways we think uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19 gets into cells is through this receptor called the ACE2 receptor. And some of you may have heard of ACE inhibitors that you, you take for your blood pressure, so kind of the same, same pathway. But you mentioned that the virus perhaps doesn't need ACE2 in order to get inside your your mini lungs in a dish anyway, your organoids. Um, do you have any idea how they're getting in or that remains to be explored? That definitely remains to be explored. We've definitely shown that there's a lot of clusters that don't express ACE2 and they still contain uh, viral um, RNA. And what's interesting is that there's some, uh, you know, kind of hypothesis driven papers that are wondering whether there's little microtubules that are being expressed from cell to cell that allows the passage of um, this virus to uh, other cells. Because when we actually do infections, we put this um, uh, carboxycellulose or methylose um, overlay, and that kind of slows down. It's like this thick substance into our cell culture system that slows down the spread of the virus. And we definitely see that the virus is spreading from cell to cell to cell. So it's making these nice kind of like clusters of these infected cell populations. So it's definitely more of um, a um, close by infection um, and all the cells are infected. They do not have to express ACE2. So we're definitely working on that. Yeah, a little, and, and that's little a, viral and, tunnels with, mm -hmm. with microtubules maybe. Sorry, Dr. Snyder, go ahead. No, I was just saying that that was one of the uh, things that struck us very, very early on because um, you know, the word had been that the ACE2 receptor is what is required for infection. And in front of our eyes, we are seeing that many cells that do not express ACE2 are being infected. And conversely, not all the ACE2 receptor expressing cells were infected. Uh. Um, so we knew that there had to be other mechanisms and there are other mechanisms for a virus to get in. For example, it can completely bypass that and just simply be invaginated by the cell. So right. it, it can be kind of penocytosed, so to speak, and encircled by the cell and then make it to a lysosome like that. And of course, we're trying drugs to block that thing. So as Sandra said, probably what we're going to need is not only blocking that receptor, but also blocking all the other alternative routes that it can get in. So a cocktail. The other thing that's interesting is you know, we're, we're kind of an all-purpose lab when we do organoids. Not only do we do lungs, we even do mini brains. And of course, we're infecting the mini brains. Now, the brain, as we know, we're starting to learn that there's CNS COVID-19 as well. Yep. The brain doesn't have ACE2 receptors, but nevertheless, right. it's getting infected. So one of the areas that we're also investigating um, is... is alternative ways of getting in that could explain some of the brain diseases. The one thing that's kind of interesting, and I think lung people should love this, is that the brain has analogous cells to the lung in it. They express the same receptors. I mean, some of the same genes. Ciliated cells in the brain that line the ventricles look like ciliated cells in the lung. And one of the things we're playing with is the, the brain is a real mystery as to what's going on with COVID-19. So we're starting to wonder whether the lung can teach us about the brain. In other words, the cells that are getting infected in, in the brain are those that are like the lung. Oh. So, uh, so it, it's been a lot of fun actually having this, this mixed organ lab above the neck and below the neck. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> One other question I thought about, um, you mentioned how this model or tool can be used to look at some, some of the um, gender and, and race-based differences and maybe even address some of the, the disparities in our research. You know, research, certain populations are often underrepresented. Um, can you address that a little bit more, how this tool could, could possibly help that? Yeah, absolutely. This is also the problem with primary lung tissue is um, you don't get the choice of where the lung tissue is coming from. Right. Um, <clears throat> but the only issue is, is you really have to tease out genetic versus epigenetic causes of this disparity. And that's, you know, the most important thing. The only thing we can truly test in the dish by using iPSCs from different sexes and ethnicities is genetic disparities. Right. For epigenetic disparities, 
we'd have to like model, you know, um, constant inflammation or constant stress or, you know, other factors of just like being alive and not just how we're genetically built. So uh, that is a very complicated question with, uh, you know, a probably very complicated answer. But it at least addresses the genetic side of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But um, one of the, we're collab, we have a colleague who is, trying to some extent to emulate what these epigenetic or environmental perturbations could be. So he actually has our lung organoids and is, is exposing them to vaping toxins and to nicotine and trying to emulate what it's like um, to be smoking and seeing whether that changes upregulate or downregulate certain receptors. But with that in mind, you know, again, it's always a poor man's way of doing that, but the system allows us to perhaps change the kind of inflammatory cytokines the organoids are exposed to, perhaps change the microbiome that they're exposed to, try to emulate certain kinds of diseases like a hyperglycemic environment or an environment that has certain known oh, occupational toxins and things of that sort. So, Sanjay's right. I think at the end of the day, what we're hoping is that this disease disparity really has nothing to do with genetic underpinnings. It really means we need to pay attention to societal, uh, societal economic disparity if we want to address disease disparity. But we'll prove that with the data. We have another question that just came through, which I, I, I think will be a very similar answer to to the, the one you just gave, looking at genetic uh, differences, um, risk factors. So we know that uh, people with um, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, tend to be at risk for more serious COVID-19 disease. Is that something that your model can look at? Yeah, absolutely. And also there are some HLA types that predispose uh, patients to this disease. So mm -hmm. that's actually a lot simpler because then you could just take the fibroblasts or blood cells from patients with that HLA type and then differentiate them lung organoids and kind of determine the interaction with a T cells, whether they're, again, they're primary or iPSC derived because we were a lot of labs are able to derive a variety of hematopoietic uh, cells and immune cells. Um, but then from the context of comorbidities, um, absolutely, we've been not only, you know, adding the vaping chemicals in, but uh, you can model inflammation by adding TGF beta and other you know, pro-inflammatory molecules into the lung organoid system in order to uh, kind of replicate an, a high inflammatory state of being, which is what's seen in obesity, which is what's seen in you know, elevated blood pressure um, and like the metabolic syndrome, you know, just in general. Um, and then what we can also do and um, what we have a couple of people working on the lab is senescing the cells. So in old age, the cells stop really, you know, growing and replicating and they're just kind of like stuck and unable to undergo mitosis. And, you know, is that the reason why the older population um, is more affected, is more highly affected, not only because they might have a hyperinflammatory response to infection, but also because they're unable to, you know, repair the lung after all that damage because of the senescent state. So we're currently um, performing those experiments and able to senesce this, uh, our uh, lung organoid model. Another question just came in. Um, that's a good one. Does your model <laughs> allow you to investigate recovery or clearance? of the virus? That is a good question. We've okay. only actually looked at 24 hours of infection in order to see by adding compounds or different uh, blockers of the inflammatory response, whether we're actually just getting decreased infectivity. Right. Um, we are also looking at various cell death assays just to see you know, at one point, uh, 24, 48, 72 hours after infection, at one point, if we remove the virus itself, um, are we starting to um, kind of stop the cell death and starting to get regeneration? But um, we've only looked out 72 hours. That's just not enough time. So I think we just need to really push uh, these lung organoid cultures um, out, but we have to figure out a way to also replenish the stock because this is a finite model system in a finite 96 well, which is, you know, as everyone knows, like super tiny. So if uh -huh. we add a very tiny amount of the virus and it infects every cell, 
then there's not that ability of uninfected cells to help regenerate or recover from infection. So that is just something that we need, just need to think through a little bit better to determine how best to mimic recovery. But what that question does is get into something very speculative, but very intriguing that Sandra and I have talked a lot about. And as you know, we're developmental biologists and we see everything from that lens, even if we're talking about old age or, or infections in adult. If you notice when Sanja was going through how we make these lung organoids, how we actually go from lung progenitor cells, immature cells to more mature cells, the key molecule that's added at the very end is dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. Now we all assume all, as clinicians, we always assume that dexamethasone has been so therapeutic in these very sick people because it's anti-inflammatory and does all kinds of things. One intriguing aspect, and it certainly does that, we're not saying it doesn't do that, but one intriguing aspect could be, could it in fact also be tapping into some residual immature lung progenitors that even adults have? that now in response to dexamethasone are replacing and helping recovery with regard to that. So looking at that aspect, not just as, in, uh, as inflammobiologists, but as developmental biologists, that this may be some self-recovery that even adults are doing in response to the dexamethasone, because we know how critical it is for development. Uh, uh, Evan, that's exactly the question I was gonna ask you. Was, <laughs> I knew was, it. I could see it in your face. <laughs> well, you totally, you totally uh, went ahead and, and answered it because I wondered about that. That as a question as to why a steroid would be so useful. Uh, they're finding, at least in the severe patients, and um, that that's that's fascinating. Is there any? Do you find any dose uh, dose relationship or concentration in in your model? that reflects the levels that we see in humans when we use steroids? I mean, are you at a, a level with your, your dexamethasone that may not be levels we reach in humans? Can you, can you even comment on that? It might be hard to be able to answer, but um, you know, is there some do dose response here that, could, that, that you find in your model that could help us? Are we using too little? Are we using, maybe we need to use more for, for at least for the effect that you're mentioning, Evan, about the, the change in the, uh, the development of the cells. So when we add dexamethasone, it's tiny, tiny amounts because we only add it in order to mature the lung organoids. And then when I go into BSL3 to infect, I actually remove the media with all the growth factors and the dexamethasone. So then I put them in a base media with no other, um, with no other dexamethasone in order to then not have a uh, abnormal response to this uh, virus, but I really like your idea. And what we should be doing is then after a certain time period of these lung organoids being infected, then do dose responses, add different um, um, quantities of the dexamethasone in order to look at recovery, um, especially in our system, we can you know, not have immune cells and therefore only focus on the epithelial and mesenchymal cells and see um, what uh, the dexamethasone actually does and determine an appropriate dose for recovery. Yeah, so what Sandra's saying, Mike, we're gonna put you to work. It was a great, <laughs> it was a great idea and we're gonna get you into the lab. <laughs> well, one other question you mentioned, I think I heard you say vaping and, and, and um, tobacco smoke. Did you say you have been looking at that in your model? And yeah. the American Lung Association certainly would be interested in that. Yeah, we we we, we definitely are. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, as you know, smokers uh, are, are are more susceptible to COVID nineteen than non smokers, and that includes vapors. And uh, we have a colleague, a guy named Ben Finley, who's all over this. You know, we. Uh, he, he, and in fact, he, he's doing dose responses and things of that sort. So we don't have the answer yet, but yes, we're, we're investigating, investigating that heavily. Well, that was my third question was, are there other labs that have this model and are, are, are working and are you finding similar results between the different labs or are you the only ones using this organoid model? I, I would say that Sandra 
has created the world's best lung organoids. So <laughs> if, there, if there's other labs doing it, they're, they're our collaborators. <laughs> but there are other labs, uh, but they're more focused on either alveolar spheres because they really just care about the type two cells um, or they're focusing on what, what are called like airway organoids. So they really only want like kind of goblet or uh, club cells present but we're definitely the first lab to try and create an organoid with all the various um, lung cells. Great, keep up the good work. <laughs> Dr. Akuthota has joined us, thank you. Another uh, mission committee member. Did you have a question, uh, Praveen? I did, and sorry that I, I jumped in late and I, I missed a little bit, so I apologize if this is a repeat, uh, but I, I did catch the first uh, 20, 25 minutes or so, so a fantastic presentation. Um, both of you, but I, I wanted to ask you uh, and tell me if, I, if this is a repeat, how can you use your model to kind of overlay uh, additional things that we're very interested in in, in, in COVID infection, like, you know, a mechanical ventilation interaction with, um, so stretch strain, um, you know, how mechanical forces might, uh, uh, might influence, you know, uh, infection and response to infection. Um, and you know how things like supplemental oxygen delivery may be things that we do because we have to, um, and, and when we're taking care of patients, may, might also you know potentially be 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 harmful. Some of that you know um, trap of uh, you know potentially doing harm when we're when we're scrambling to do our best to 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 do to do good with mechanical ventilators and and, and oxygen delivery. No, that's a great question. So. Um, when I first developed this lung organoid system, I was actually interested in learning how the lung develops from a premature baby standpoint. So um, I knew that a fetus actually does stretch their lungs in order to develop. So um, there are there are these specific um, plates that have like a rubberized membrane that actually does stretch. You just have to put them in a specific uh, machine, and you know through the software that's connected, you just type in you know, at what stretch do you want them to be stretched at? And then, you know, timing wise, um, at what interval? And so I would use the lung organoids, I would, but again, I would dissociate them, plate them as a monolayer onto that stretchy membrane. And then I would input the stretch in order to uh, mimic the fetus. But obviously fetal stretch is a lot less compared to the stretch that uh, these lungs undergo uh, with mechanical ventilation. So I think you could use the exact same system just like plate the, the organoids down as a monolayer on, onto that stretchy um, the plates, and then actually input the stretch that the lungs are undergoing with mechanical ventilation. Um, but again, you would have to know those parameters, you would have to know those intervals, and you know the sicker the patients, um, whether you can also replicate you know high frequency ventilation or you know um, whether they need high peak, low peak. Um, those are very specific, but I think you could at least get the basic, you know, just stretch mechanisms to see how that itself induces lung injury along with, um, you know, the infection of SARS-CoV-2. Right, and we can also emulate certain things that you touched on are obviously easier to, to replicate than others, but we can certainly change the, the oxygen tension, the oxygen mm -hmm. concentration in the dish. We, we have a uh, Spe special culture conditions where we can do room air, hypoxia, hyperoxia. And then of course, um, you know, the, there's always the quandary, is it the oxygen per se on the lung or is it the oxygen impinging on inflammatory cells that then secondarily make the cytokines? So we can do that too. We, we can start teasing that apart by adding or not adding alveolar macrophages or, or vascular endothelial cells or things of that sort. But you, you hit the nail on the head that the most important thing is recognizing that the lung is not just a single cell type in a monolayer. It's three dimensions of lung cells and then non-lung cells, all of which make the organ. Well, terrific. Any other questions from our panelists? Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Evan Snyder and Dr. Sandra Liebel for a really fascinating presentation. Um, very inspiring, I think, the ability to repurpose pre-existing on-the-shelf FDA-approved medications is, is really, um, really very exciting and, and could help a lot of people in developing countries, for example, where yeah 
where Merck isn't, you know, coming out <laughs> with expensive new, new therapies. Um, so thank you both for that uh, beautiful presentation. And I just want to invite everyone uh, to come to our next uh, connections meeting uh, next week, Wednesday, the 10th, we'll be hearing from uh, some members of the San Diego County uh, Health and Human Services and Public Health Department about the county's response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that'll be very interesting. So with that, I'll say good night to everyone. It was nice having dinner with you all and we will uh, <laughs> see you next week. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Feel free bye. to contact us by email if you have additional questions. Oh, thank you. Terrific.